Deuteronomy 32, verse 4 is our text. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Righteousness, beloved, concerns a standard, that which is right. So according to what standard is God righteous? Is there some law outside of God, some law above God, to which he must conform in order to be righteous? The answer is no. Jehovah is his own standard. That's part of his absolute self-sufficiency. God's righteousness, therefore, is his unswerving commitment to himself as his own standard. This is the key. There is no other standard or law according to which God can be examined or tried or accused or condemned. It's not United Nations law or national law that is the standard to which Jehovah must measure up. It's not political correctness or public opinion. It's not the views of the false church or the ungodly world. God's only and own standard for his own righteousness is himself and his own will. God's righteousness is his perfect harmony and conformity to himself as his sole standard and complete criterion. As John Calvin repeatedly puts it, God always acts like himself. In in all his will, in all his being, in all his thinking, in all his doing, He acts in perfect conformity with himself as absolute and supreme, answerable to nobody and nothing. And this is wonderful. This is the sovereign freedom of God. And God's righteousness being his righteousness is infinite, eternal, unchangeable and omnipotent righteousness. It always prevails. It's, this righteousness of God is good and wise, holy and true. And so God's righteousness infinitely transcends and judges all that calls itself righteousness. In our fallen world and amongst all individuals, all groups and all states. He's not the one who who can ever be brought to the bar. Everybody else and everything, everything else is brought to his bar to be judged because he is the righteous one. God's righteousness is evident, for instance, in the relationship between the first and second persons of the Holy Trinity. Remember, righteousness involves a standard. Well, the Father is the standard for the Son. And the Son is the express image of his Father. The Son perfectly measures up to the Father and conforms to him. Something which doesn't always happen with human sons. and Sometimes Father sets the wrong standards for their children. But this son perfectly measures up to the perfect standard of his father and conforms to him. He is the glorious word of God who is unswervingly committed to his father. That's his righteousness. A word here about English words. On the one hand, we have righteousness and Related words like righteous, upright, 
righteously, right, and all the rest. And they come from the German word recht. Recht, German, right, English. On the other hand, we have the word justice, from which we have just, justly, judgment, and so on. And those words come from the Latin justitia. But both words, whether taken from the German and righteousness, or the Latin and justice, are essentially the same. There are different shades of meaning with them. The justice words more usually apply to formal legal settings and groups. We think more often of righteousness connected with individuals, but essentially they're the same. Justice words, righteousness words, because they're legal words. They deal with ethical laws. They are concerned with moral standards. And now with this foundation, we turn to God's righteousness. Part one. God's righteousness first in legislating, that is, in laying down the law, and second in punishing, that is, in judging those who break the law which God has laid down. God's righteousness in legislating and God's righteousness in punishing. Now it is customary and helpful to speak of God's moral law for mankind. And in this sermon we're not so much thinking about angels, though we'll touch upon them at times. It's helpful to think of God's moral law for mankind, which is summed up in the Ten Commandments. Now, because of who God is as the uncreated, eternal, and glorious, and supreme Lord, his moral law for mankind must, first of all, address man's duty to God. And so you think of the first commandment. Have no other gods before me. Why? Because God's righteousness is his being unswervingly committed to himself as the only true God, and therefore he comes to man and says, since this is the case, your righteousness includes centrally your being devoted to me. Moving to the second commandment, well, God is spirit, and therefore man cannot make any images of him. And therefore it's perfectly righteous for God to forbid all making of images by mankind and worshipping and serving of them. Coming to the third commandment. God is true. His name is weighty. Therefore, man's righteousness is not treating God's name as if it were vanity and nothing. And when you come to the fourth commandment concerning the Sabbath, God is Lord of time because he creates us and our time. And so he sovereignly ordains that we rest one day in seven. And coming to the second table of the law, since God has made man a rational, moral creature and made man in community with other human beings, God righteously regulates our behavior towards our neighbors. The fifth commandment, our duty to parents. Well, God has given them authority over us, so therefore that is right. The sovereign God, righteous in himself, gives, delegates authority to parents, therefore children must honor and obey their parents. The sixth commandment, the righteous God who is the source of life, the sovereign over it, says to man, you cannot take human life except in the certain specifically determined situations where I authorize individuals to take the life of other individuals, self-defense, or I give authority to the state to wage war and 
to execute capital offenders. And when you come to the seventh commandment, righteousness here is very easy to see too, because God has made man and woman, given them this exclusive bond between one man and one woman for life, and therefore thou shalt not commit adultery. No sexual liaisons or sexually emotional ties before or outside of marriage to that one person God gives you. God is the sovereign who gives property to whom and when and he wills. Therefore thou shalt not steal. God is a God of truth. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. Therefore thou shalt not bear false witness. And man is to be content with Jehovah's sovereign disposition of all things. And towards him personally. And therefore thou shalt not covet. God's his own standard. And God sets the standards for mankind in accordance with who God is and the world that man is placed in by God. <coughs> Jehovah's moral law is summed up by the Lord Jesus in terms of love for God and one's neighbor. And this is right. It couldn't be any other way because it conforms to the standard that God is infinitely blessed and worthy of adoration and service and therefore we must also love our neighbor for God's sake the righteousness of God as legislator and what is our calling regarding Jehovah's righteousness in his moral law it is this we must keep God's law out of gratitude for his salvation and by the power of his grace. That is righteousness for human beings. And we must be unswervingly committed to the righteous God and his righteous law as our standard. The church confesses in Isaiah 33 verse 22, The Lord is our lawgiver, not man. Psalm 19 verse 8. The statutes of the law are right. Rejoicing the heart. And every true Christian says. I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. And I hate every false way. Psalm 119 verse 28. And that 119th Psalm is not only about the glory of God's word, but it's about the glory of the Lord's word, especially as it concerns the righteousness of God's commandments. And we sang that in the part we sung earlier. And the Christian has this promise from Jesus Christ, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. And our calling regarding God's righteous legislative power also involves teaching God's moral law. Parents teach God's moral law to their children, especially in Deuteronomy 6 and the whole book of Proverbs. The church is required to teach God's law. It teaches God's law to the ungodly that they may see their sins and trust in Jesus Christ. And it teaches God's law to the saints as the rule of gratitude for our rich salvation in Jesus Christ. We see that near the end of our Heidelberg Catechism in many Lord's Days. <coughs> Scripture also includes what may be called divine positive laws. And what are divine positive laws, you are asking? Well, these laws, like God's moral laws summed in the Ten Commandments, they're laws given by God, they're divine positive laws, and they're recorded in Scripture. 
But unlike the moral laws, summed in the Ten Commandments, God's positive laws forbid or require something not because of the nature of the things in themselves, but merely because God says so. So God's positive laws rest upon his sovereignty. X is forbidden or required because God says so. It's a good lesson to teach our children at times. You must do this. Not even, and I'm willing to explain why in many, many regards, but you also need to learn to do this because I said so. God does that. Sovereign positive law. And yet these sovereign positive laws of God are not without their wisdom. And so God's positive laws are temporary. They last only for part of this age. And then they pass away when their purpose is fulfilled. And I will give you some concrete examples with which you're well familiar, which will make these divine positive laws very clear. Think of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There is nothing of itself wrong with eating from a tree. There is nothing of itself morally sinful with eating from a particular type of tree. It was only the bare sovereign word of God that meant that it was wrong for Adam and Eve and sinful to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Had God chosen, he could have decided that not that tree over there, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but that tree over there was the one that was forbidden, Adam and Eve. And so we have here an example of a divine positive law. God is sovereign in saying one tree you're not allowed to eat from. This was wise because God wanted to test Adam and Eve to see if they would obey him just because he says so. And it was temporary because there's no tree of the knowledge of good and evil as such that we can eat of today. And this tree was buried at the flood and has doubtless rotted away. Maybe it's now fossil fuels. Here's another example of divine positive law. The whole of the Old Testament Jewish ceremonial laws. I'll take one particular instance of these laws. The Old Testament ceremonial food laws. Pork, rabbit, lobster were forbidden the Jews in the Old Testament days. Not because there's anything intrinsically sinful about these foods. But because God, for a time, wanted to keep the Jews separate from the Gentiles. And he thought this would be one good way, amongst others, of doing this. Sovereignly, he said, this food, but not that food. Wisely, because he purposed to preserve the antithesis to some degree between Jews and Gentiles. Temporary, because now God's people are not to be divided over food laws, but united in Jesus Christ, who has smashed down the middle wall of partition, the Old Testament laws, which were designed to keep Jews and Gentiles apart. And we're looking at these Old Testament food laws on Tuesday mornings. There is also an element of divine positive law in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are moral laws, but within them there's an element of divine positive law. Which commandment? The fourth. Which aspect of the fourth commandment? Will the particular day. God could have declared the fifth day of the week to be the day of rest, or the third, or he could have chosen two days in the week, or he could have chosen one and a half days in the week, or three quarters of a day, you get the point. But in the Old Testament, he chose the last day of the week, sovereignly, 
And the wisdom aspect is that this was the day in which God rested from his creating. And this is temporary because the seventh day requirement has now passed away because there's a greater wisdom attaching to the day now in the New Testament year being the first day of the week because that's the day in which Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And redemption is a greater work in creation. And the Holy Spirit has been poured out in the gathering for the gathering of the Catholic or universal church of Jesus Christ. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. There are perhaps especially two areas where human positive law is laid down. One is in the military. Commands are given, especially to new recruits, which have little or no ground in the nature of the things themselves. And the point is to train the young soldiers in unquestioning obedience. We're teaching you discipline. You just do it because the sergeant tells you to do it. We're teaching you group cohesion. And also, in battle, there may come a time when a particularly unpleasant command is given you, and we don't want you to think about it. You just climb over the top and run with fixed bayonet. The second instance of human positive commands even more familiar to us all, involves parents and their children, especially smaller children. You forbid them to do certain things, not because the things per se are wrong, but because they're children and they don't understand things. And if you allow them to do these things, then they can very easily find themselves in the midst of something harmful. So you say to your child, don't go near that pier, or you might fall in. No more biscuits for you, or you'll not be able to eat your dinner. But it's not that peers, or touching peers, or biscuits, or eating biscuits, are wrong in themselves. The principles behind this are the sixth commandment, we want to preserve life, so watch yourself around the pier. And the fifth commandment, you must honor and obey Parents, and we also teach our children in the way we discipline them, that the principled moral commandments, the Ten Commandments, they're the ones that we're going to discipline them more strictly for, not these more positive ones, where the reason doesn't lie in themselves, that we're going to do everything we can, that they have empty stomachs to eat their dinner, and that they don't fall off the pier and drown. And so we come from... God's righteousness in legislating or laying down the law to God's righteousness in punishing or judging those who break the law. And the punishment aspect is important because with God, law isn't a suggestion or a recommendation. It is a requirement. And with God especially, where there's a law, and the law is broken and there is no punishment, well, that can't be right. Because God's righteousness demands punishment. Every sin ever committed will be punished. And the gospel says there's a way of relief and total deliverance and punishment in Jesus Christ. So we move from legislative justice or legislative righteousness to punitive or punishing justice or righteousness. Let's think of Adam's fall. Let's go back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2, 17. And when Adam ate of it, God was just right. He did die. He died spiritually. He became dead in trespasses and sins, which was exactly what God meant and intended 
in that threat. Adam died spiritually, and Adam died immediately, in the very day he ate of it, at that precise instant. This is important to say, because Abraham Kuyper, and he's followed here by many to their own loss, Abraham Kuyper, trying to find some sort of biblical basis for his whole theology and theory of common grace, disagrees with the historic Christian explanation of the fall of Adam. God's judicial threat, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, says Kuyper, includes physical death at the very moment of eating. That is, God promised to kill Adam there and then so that he would strike him down dead under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with a partially eaten fruit in his hand. One wonders how Eve could have come to him and tempted Adam if she had already died instantly, physically. But, says Kuiper, God gave Adam common grace like an antidote to poison so that Adam did not keel over and die beneath the branches of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This novel misunderstanding of Genesis 2 and 3 misunderstands the nature of God's judicial threat as if it included physical death there and then. And of course, it raises all sorts of problems regarding God's righteousness. The truth is, and God's righteousness requires this, that God did exactly what he said he would do. Unlike Abraham Kuyper's theory. God, at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is not like a parent who makes an unwise threat of punishment and then the child does the thing he was forbidden to do, whereupon the parent realizes that, hey, if I punish this child here, this is not a good idea. I specified a wrong form of punishment. And now I'm going to have to eat my words and not do it and run the risk of my child thinking that mummy and daddy don't really mean what they say and I can get away with this. And you know what? I can get away with that. And even though they rant and rage and say X, Y, and Z, they never do anything or they never do what they say they're going to do. And that is, mommy and dad aren't just, don't keep their word and actually tell lies to me. And therefore, as a good child who imitates father or mother, I'm going to think to myself that breaking, breaking laws and lying and not keeping one's word is basically a good thing because my mom and dad do it. They do it all the time. They do it all the time with me. Yikes. Well, the continuation of Adam beyond that day, that fateful day, and the continuation of the earthly creation is not due to common grace, which doesn't exist. It's due to God's decree and God's providence. And by the way, Adam was elect. He can't fall down dead at the base of that tree. He needed some time, actually not a whole lot of time, but he needed some time in order to live for God to come and show him his sin and point him to the mother promise of Genesis 3 verse 15, the seed of the woman who's going to crush Satan's head. So he needs that time as an elect to be brought to conversion. And of course, to have children through Eve because God's eternal purpose and plan involved human generations over centuries and millennia. In fact, the entire history of the world. And Christ must come. For he is, at his cross, the legal basis for the salvation of Adam and Eve. And indeed all the elect. For without the coming of the Christ, thousands of years future, God had no proper legal grounds to regenerate and convert Adam and Eve. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he, said Moses in Deuteronomy 32. The same person who by God's Spirit wrote Genesis 2 and 3. Before Adam's fall, God also punished the whole 
human race. Christ excluded, as Romans 5 explains. And here there are especially two divine attributes on display. God, in his sovereignty, makes Adam the federal head or covenant representative for the entire human race. Adam didn't ask to be federal head, no more than he asked to be created. He didn't agree to be the representative of the whole human race. And we, for our part, didn't opt in or opt out. We couldn't, for we didn't even exist. God sovereignly appointed him as the head. And then God's righteousness, the second attribute, so to speak, comes in in the form of punishing sin, both in Adam, so that he died with total depravity on that day, and in us. Here's the parallel between Adam, the covenant head, and the human race in him. Adam sinned, and therefore we sinned in him. Adam is guilty for his sin. We are guilty for our sin in Adam. God punished Adam with total depravity. God punished the human race with total depravity at our conception and onwards. And the good news for God's people is also set forth in Romans 5. God sovereignly appointed another covenant head. The last Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ as the representative, the federal representative of all the elect. And we didn't ask for this. We weren't even born. And then through Jesus Christ, God righteously forgives all of our sins including our sin in Adam and the totally depraved nature with which we were conceived and born. And God righteously reckons or imputes to us the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And we'll say more about that this evening. Moving from the fall of humanity in Genesis to the conquest of Canaan in Joshua, How is the latter righteous? And the aggressive atheists in our day are making this point forcibly, though pathetically weakly, more and more ad nauseum. Let me show you how it is perfectly righteous for God. Remember who we're dealing with. He's the sovereign creator. He gives life and he takes it away. And none can say unto him, What doest thou? And none can stay his hand. He's the one who gives land and he takes it away. It's all under his sovereign bestowal. <coughs> and then think who these inhabitants of Canaan were. They weren't like Adam pre fall, they weren't even a less wicked sort of unbeliever. The Pentateuch especially keeps repeating how degenerate and wicked they were. And their total depravity had worked itself out to a terrible degree. Leviticus 18, for instance, talks about the rampant adultery amongst the Canaanites, incest, sodomy, bestiality, and offering their children as sacrifices to Moloch. Deuteronomy 18 says the land was filled with witches and wizards, charmers and consulters with familiar spirits and the dead. Those are just some of the sins of the land. So that, to use the ideology of the Pentateuch, the land was defiled and made filthy by their sins and the land vomited them forth. Their sins were crying out to God for judgment. And God is the sovereign and righteous one. (coughs) And he doesn't even judge them prematurely. With regard to time, we're told that he waited in his forbearance till the fourth generation after Abraham to destroy them because, as he explained to his friend, their iniquity is not yet full. Genesis 15, verse 16. And God is also sovereign as to the agents with which he punishes sin in this world. With Sodom and Gomorrah, he chose to do it with fire and brimstone from heaven. 
With the firstborn of Egypt, he chose to send the angel of death in the tenth plague. With the rebels in number 16, he caused the ground to open up. And in the book of Joshua, he used the sword of Israel at God's direct, explicit command. God isn't going to tell a Christian or a nation with a lot of Christians in it by an express command today to go and attack and wipe out any other people. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. And Moses is the one who's been telling Joshua at the word of God to take over Canaan. He's the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. The God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Let me look with you at a couple of other passages of scripture. Which bring out other aspects of God's righteous judgment. Jeremiah 12 is the first passage I'm thinking of. Jeremiah 12, the first two verses, state Jeremiah's problem with the prosperous wicked. (coughs) Jeremiah's problem with the prosperous wicked and how it fits with God's righteousness. Jeremiah 12, verse 1. Righteous art thou, O Lord. He's got that straight. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with you, but I don't understand how it fits. With this thing. Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Thou hast planted them in thy providence, yea, they've taken root, they grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reign. And then Jeremiah's prayer regarding the prosperous wicked in the second half of verse 3. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. He understands that's what God's doing with them in their prosperity. And so God's attitude to the prosperous wicked is found in verse 8. My heritage, Israel, is like unto me like as a lion in the forest. It crieth out against me. It attacks me. Therefore have I given. It's not God loves them and therefore he makes them prosper. God makes them prosper and in his righteousness he's preparing them for the slaughter and he hates them for their sin. Our God is a rock. (coughs) His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. All of them judgment. The God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. (coughs) And the second and final passage, Luke 13. Luke 13. I'm going to read the first five verses of Luke 13. The righteousness of God crops up because of Calamities that have taken place. Luke 13 verses 1 through 5. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, because they didn't understand the righteousness of God, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, Ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen, upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And in this passage, we have reference to two horrible forms of death. Wicked Herod came and slaughtered some Pharisees and mixed their blood with the blood of the animals they were sacrificing. And a tower in Jerusalem, the Tower of Siloam, fell and killed 18 people. Now obviously in these disasters and calamities, some of the people killed may have been old men, or old women, or middle-aged, or young, maybe children. Here's the point regarding God's righteous punishment of the impenitent wicked. 
God's righteousness with regard to punishment, his punitive righteousness, requires that he punish them. It requires that God punishes them in accordance with their sins so that those who are worst get worse punishment than those who are not as bad. But God's punishment of the impenitent wicked does not require that God punishes all people in the same way in this life. God's punishment of the wicked in this life does not require that he punishes them all at the same time or that he gives all the wicked, say, 73 years on this life and no more. So everybody dies at the same time and all of the ungodly have the same afflictions throughout their lifetime, whatever way you measure them. God's righteousness requires that he punishes them, that he punishes them in perfect accordance with their wickedness to that degree, but not when in this life or how he punishes them. There's a sovereignty in the execution of his punishment. And so Jehovah righteously punishes all the sins of all the reprobates, but he sovereignly determines when he punishes them in this life and how he punishes them in this life or how especially he punishes them. And by the way, the main form of punishment of the ungodly in this world is not making a building fall upon them. The main form of punishment of God upon the wicked in this life is giving them over in his wrath to greater sins and bondage in their sins. And by the way, 99% and more of the punishment of the impenitent and ungodly awaits the everlasting burnings of hell. It's only a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion that's ever inflicted upon any of them in this life. And we add too that the elect children of God are not immune from being struck by calamitous terrors either. Maybe some of these Galileans, or maybe some of the 18 upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell, were actually believers. Earthquakes and horrific car accidents and terrorist attacks don't bypass the people of God. But when these things happen to the wicked, to the righteous, or even if they die peacefully in their sleep, it comes to them in God's love, and it is for them not a punishment, but a passageway into glory. Our God is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Which brings us finally in this sermon, to the final judgment. Here we are focusing not on the vindication and rewarding of the righteousness of the righteous in Christ, but on the punishment of ungodly, impenitent men and women, as well as Satan and his demons. That day will be far and away the greatest public court ever. It will deal not with the particular crimes of an individual, but all other human beings too. And it will deal with the whole lives of every human being. Billions upon billions of people and all the fallen angels too. You're the whole life of everybody. Not just a few people going to a human court to be judged with regard to one or two crimes. On that day, everything will be exposed completely and without effort. Equally on view, alongside and behind every deed, will be the evil heart, the wicked thoughts, motivations, and secrets of men. There will be no need for a sharp lawyer to engage in clever cross-examination in order to bring to light things that the accused would rather keep in the darkness. There will be no possibility of any lies or any cover-ups that go undetected. Because actually there won't be any possibility or any lies or of cover-ups at all. Because the all-seeing and all-knowing God will judge 
not just the open things, but every secret of man. And every absolutely perfect justice will be done and will be seen to be done. There will be no favoritism, no partiality, and no bribery. These things are absolutely impossible. The rich and the powerful on that day will not get preferential treatment. They will not have standing up for them and on their side the top lawyers that the rest of us can't afford. They will not be able to buy justice. Because sometimes you see the rich in a state and you think that person really is guilty. And yet they get a top lawyer and they get off and you say, well, there's one level of justice for the really rich and there's another level of justice for the rest of us. And you say, well, it's an imperfect fallen world. But it will all be put to right on the last day with a judge who cannot be bought and the jury who cannot be bribed. We're dealing here with the perfect righteousness of the one great judge. Father Abraham rightly said, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God is going to judge the world by that man whom he has ordained and perfectly qualified and fitted for the task, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the world in righteousness. The standard being the being and character of God as expressed in his law not merely the laws and statutes of the state that can be changed and abridged and dumped the punishment for all the billions of sins of all of the wicked will be everlasting hell with degrees of punishment so that those who gave fullest vent to their wickedness and expressed it more fully than the other totally depraved people will be punished worse. This is the great theodicy, the vindication of God's absolute righteousness. And on that day, everyone will say, in effect, he is the rock on the judgment day. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. For everything he did in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, everything in the church, everything in the world, everything that involves the law, everything that involves the gospel, all the history of the world, in every country and with every person, plainly manifested before the whole world and universally admitted Because every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the righteous Lord. And it's his cross that is the only hope of those who know themselves to be listed with those who are currently in unbelief and of that before them outside of repentance must turn to him. Trust in Jesus Christ as the only Savior. And then you pass From death to life in the righteousness of God. And we'll look at it more fully, especially that salvation aspect tonight. Amen. Our Father in heaven, may we understand and tremble before thy righteousness and judgment and wrath and jealousy as the one who lays down and enforces and punishes according to thy law. Teach us the fear of thy name, in Jesus Christ. And may we afresh flee to him for mercy and pardon. Amen.